Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown, a midday edition with my friend Brian Geltzeiler, Hoops Critic on Twitter. And strap yourselves in because you're going to get a lot of terrific NBA insight in the next few minutes. So, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm good, Coach. Always a pleasure to be with you, my man. Terrific. Well, thanks for uh, taking some time out of your day to join us. And, you know, I thought we could jump right in and talk a little bit about the, what the playoffs are going on. We got 1-1 one, one across the board. Uh, what is the most intriguing uh, playoff matchup for you so far? You know, Nick, I pride myself on trying to be right with as many things as possible, obviously. And the one series I'm the most intrigued with is the one where, frankly, I think I'm the most wrong. I thought San Antonio, I, I thought it was going to be a seven-game series. I never imagined in my life to see the level of dominance that Golden State's offense has asserted over San Antonio's defense. And I look for solutions for the Spurs and there's not many of them. It, it, it's it's going to be tough. You have you got one capable defender to guard Curry and Thompson and then Kawhi Leonard. You can't guard them both, Nick. That's a big problem that they have. The other thing is I was surprised that Popovich was hesitant to do this. You need more splitter dunking together. Splitter is the best pick and roll defender that San Antonio has. And Golden State tore them up and pick and roll pretty well in these two games. So when I look at that one big surprise, it's just how much trouble the Spurs have had here. The Spurs really, for all intents and purposes, probably should be down in the series 2-0. I mean, no one will argue with that. With that, It was almost heartbreaking to watch what happened in Game 1, very similar to what happened in, in Denver uh, in Game 6, although they were able to pull it out. And what I had said was, you know, the, uh, when you amass experience in the playoffs, it doesn't necessarily translate from one round to the next. So the first round, they kind of got the experience and sort of how to hang on and finish that game. But it doesn't – didn't obviously, it's a different animal when you're talking about the second round and you're talking about the Spurs and what they were able to do. Uh, you know, how much credit do you want to give the Spurs for that run in game one? I give them a lot of credit, but I, I think you make a very good point, Nick. I think panic set in. And I think you, you Steph Curry's learning on the fly right now. And there's so many amazing – amazing things that he does on the court that we can lose focus of some of the things that he needs to improve on. But it's funny because a lot of people took exception with how he played in game two saying it was a mediocre game. I disagree. The numbers may not have been there. They don't win that game without Steph Curry in the fourth quarter. He played terrific down the end of the game and did everything that you want a traditional point card to do in the last four minutes of the game. Hit free throws, got to the line, took care of the basketball, made sure, you know, operated a half-court offense in a very efficient way. And to me, that was really the most important stretch of the game. Golden State was certainly ready to roll over at that point. It was very similar to what happened in game one. Curry was responsible for them not rolling over. So you talk about progress and each round being a different experience. You're absolutely right. But you got to be encouraged by a team that you saw learn something from game one to game two. Yeah, and I think Jared Jack obviously is the issue here because they want him to bring the ball up in key stretches and let Steph Curry come off screens, and, and, and that has been a problem and a blessing. J Jack came through you know, and hit some really tough shots in game two, but also contributes to the issues when they start to fall apart. So the question is, is can they get more consistent play out of him? And, and my answer really is that he is, is, a, is, is a, 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 a backup guard getting starters minutes. And so when he's getting those extra eight minutes a game, those are the eight minutes where you're getting some, some problems with. And if they could figure out a way of limiting those, they'd get the best of Jared Jack. I agree with you. And I think it's not only minutes, it's usage, it's touches, it's possessions, it's ball in his hands. And I think you look at game two, Thompson being on fire and being that hot and being somebody that San Antonio's got to worry about defensively takes Jackson off the griddle with having to play Jack so much because in that scenario you can play Curry at point guard because you got Thompson able to come off screens and he's the guy they have to worry about and you've seen Jackson's gotten creative with his starting lineups here also you know he, he stopped starting Jack and went to Landry now it's been a zelly in the series which I actually like a lot which is a very good way to compete with San Antonio's size and, and you know here's the other thing for San Antonio here you know Bonner and Dia are useless in the series Nick the two of them have been terrible because they can't defend at all Diaz obviously I mean He's normally out of shape. He's really out of shape after sitting all this time. So to me, it's got to be for the Spurs. Now, he's down to seven viable rotation players. That's a huge problem for Pop right now because this is going to be a, a hard-fought series. To me, again, I come back to the same thing. We need to see a lot of splitter and dunking together and live with the mismatches that Golden State small ball will provide there. 
Well, funnily enough, when you're talking about the Golden State small ball, the matchup that they're getting is Barnes with uh, Parker guarding him because they don't want to put Parker on Curry. It's not a good matchup for them. So suddenly, the Warriors actually have a size advantage down low, and they are very well coached. They understand how to dissect that when they come over and double team on that post up. I would expect to see that a lot more. I would agree with you. That's, that is San Antonio's dirty little secret that they'd like to hide, and Golden State has exploited it badly. Anybody Parker's been on has gotten destroyed. You saw game one, they tried to put Parker on Curry because he can bother his dribble a little bit. That didn't work out very well. You're not going to bother Curry with that. So they go to Leonard and Green sharing time on Curry and figure they can put Parker on top. So, well, we saw how well that went. Parker is a problem for them right now. And you're right. The only place they can even attempt to hide him is on Harrison Barnes. And that creates a size advantage. And Harrison Barnes, a big athletic kid, you put him down on a low block and you expect Parker to have to guard him. You're inviting a lot of double teams there. And that's and, and Golden State is the wrong team to double the post against. So it really plays into their hands. I'm very curious to see what Popovich tries to do tonight to try to solve this Parker defense problem. Yeah, I agree. I think what the adjustment made is obviously Danny Green and Kawhi Leonard are the only two guys that should be guarding um, uh, Steph Curry. Steph Curry goes into funks, though, and I don't know if it's related to how many minutes he's been playing, but certainly in game two, you saw in the third quarter, his whole body language changed. And I talked to um, Sherwood Strauss over at the at Warriors um, World, whatever their website is, and he said it's kind of normal, ho-hum, and everyone knows that that's, that's how he plays. But I got to tell you, for a guy that relies on confidence and energy, and that actually picks up the entire team, to see him with his head down and no energy, not moving for those five minutes at a time, that's like kind of death to them, and that they can't afford to have that. They can, but I think they also have to adjust a little bit. I think a big part of it was how they defended Curry. They decided pretty much, and the, the times that they defended Curry very well, we're going to be very aggressive with him out beyond the arc. Make him put it on the floor and then bring him to our good pick-and-roll defender and splitter and make him make a mid-range decision. The way that I think Golden State can adjust to that is keep Curry on the dribble. If he comes to that point, don't worry so much about the floater, which is a tough shot and a shot San Antonio wants him to take. Mm -hmm. Let him put it on the floor, go further to the rim, draw an extra defender or two, and then with his passing ability, you're going to get a lot of dunks. That would be the big adjustment I'd make because, again, if you're the Spurs, you want to trap Curry in that mid-range. I agree. The frustration certainly showed on Steph Curry, but some preparation and some strategy there can mitigate that. And that's the one thing we all forget with Curry here. 25 years old, a very young guy on a stage he's never been on before. Certainly doing a lot of great things on that stage, but we'd all be a little naive to believe that there's not going to be some growing pains here. Well, the other question now is, we went, we went back and forth on Twitter a little bit, but we can argue, uh, I'm, I'm on record, I'm going to say that Steph Curry is the best point guard in the NBA right now. I am not going to, Nick, and I respectfully disagree with you, my friend. I'm still I'm still on board with Chris Paul here. I think when Derrick Rose comes back, he very well may be there. I think Curry's catapulted himself into the top five. It's funny, I, I did a piece on my site titled The Narrative earlier this week where I discussed that, you know, Curry is on his way to me to start him. I think we're catapulting him a little soon to superstardom, I think he get he can certainly has the potential to get there. And God bless this kid. I'm not sure there's a more fun player in the league outside of LeBron James to watch play the game. And I think that's kind of gotten expectations a little bit ahead of where the kid exactly is. We're seeing him grow up before our eyes but he's still growing up, needs to learn a whole bunch on defense. And it's funny because when I look at the Denver series, I think Denver would have had a lot more success if they had been a lot more disciplined about attacking Curry on the defensive end. When they did that with Lawson and did that with Iguodala, they had some success. Steph Curry's got to get stronger. He's got to be more disciplined defensively. Those are all things that has to happen with him. Offensively, he is as developed as you can imagine. If he learns how to close games, which he looked like he did pretty well in game two, this kid's – you very well may be right in about a year is what I'm saying. All right. Because my, my, my whole point of that is offensively at least, there isn't any other player, uh, maybe aside from LeBron, that commands that much attention from, every, from all five defensive players. And that's what, like, Chris Paul doesn't do that because he doesn't shoot that well from, from inside 30 feet. And when you have that guy, and then he, and I got to tell you, I am much more impressed. His shooting is, is as impressive as all, as all 
can be. But his left-handed hook passes across court on the money to Barnes and to Clay Thompson in the corner is it's like nobody can throw those passes. And so you, you have to say his he and his ball handling is absolutely fantastic. So you're right. I think the only whole thing holding him back right now is he needs to gain 15 pounds. And if he can work as well on that, which is a lot of work at that age, you're burning so many calories. You have to work as much on your on your gaining weight as you did it on the ball handling. If he can do that, I think the sky is the limit and could be you know one of the most dominating offensive players we have in the league. I agree with you. I certainly think you get there. But you look you look at like for example as a Chris Paul comparison, late in the game you need big baskets. As great a shooter as Curry is. I have a lot more confidence in a guy handing a ball to a crunch time player like Paul. And that's not a negative on Curry. And that comes back to my original point about Curry. He's 25 years old. It's gonna, it takes some time to get yourself to that point where you have the stomach and the experience and the savvy to be able to, to capture and win those moments, to dominate those moments and make them yours. Curry's not there yet. Doesn't mean he's not gonna get there. I, you know, the thing with me, and I, I in watching these playoffs, the ball handling's always been very good. I thought it was more, more style than substance. The passing is incredible. And yes, it looks fancy and it looks spectacular, but it's effective, man. And he, you know, you have certain scenarios where you're right. You get three or four defenders who start ball watching with the ball with Curry, and it's one dribble, okay, to a pass, zipping the ball right to a guy, and the defense doesn't know what hit him. Next thing you know, the ball's dunked through the hoop. That, that's what Curry's able to do here. Listen, the kid's growing up before our eyes. He's a tremendous, tremendous young talent. And I'll tell you, I'm enjoying watching him play in these playoffs. Well, let's move on to the Heat and the Bulls because that's an interesting series. 1-1, everyone is shocked, I'm sure, that the Bulls were able to take game one. However, the Heat have shown in the past that they will lose that first game and then kind of just finish the series off in four straight. So what is your take on what's going to happen uh, tonight and for the rest of the series? I think Bulls are going to get one more, Nick. I, I, you know, I look at this series as, as a tempo war. The, to me, the outlier in this series was more game two than game one. Not that the Bulls are going to win this series, but I think we'll see close games. Here, here's the thing. The Bulls can control the Heat's running game. And you can do that with the Heat sometimes. You can slow them down. They had nine transition points in game one. Game two, I'm not sure how many they had, but I can tell you it was a lot more than nine. Okay? And, and they ran and ran and ran. But the Bulls will be disciplined about that. They will certainly slow them down in their own building and ugly up the game. And I think the Heat can beat them under that scenario, but the games will be close and entertaining and fun to watch. You know, the one thing that will tell you about putting too much stock in a game two blowout, keep in mind what happened with the Nets and the Bulls in game one. The Nets looked like world beaters. The Bulls looked like they didn't even belong on the court with them. Bulls ended up winning the series in seven. I'm not predicting that happens here with Miami, but nonetheless, I think we throw a lot of that result out in game two, understand it was the Heat's night and the Heat win, and I think these are going to be grind them out, physical, tough, fun-to-watch basketball games, but ugly basketball. Yeah, and I'm hoping for a game six because I think I'm going to go back to Chicago and sit in my old seats that my dad still goes to, uh, to see the game in and watch it because uh, it would be really exciting to be there. I think that in game two, they just look exhausted. I think this is the, the, the culmination of a seven game and another game of, of playing seven players with two starters out. And, uh, you know, they just looked like they ran out of gas in the middle of that second quarter and there wasn't much they could do. They, they certainly did. And there's going to be those moments because he's another one playing so few guys. I mean, the joke I've been making out of Tom Thibodeau, Nick, is he could turn me into a rotation player. I'm 44 years old and I'm out of shape. He, he turns anybody into a rotation player. Nate Robinson was a guy saved for, for a couple good playoff games for the Celtics in 2010, was on a scrap heap. Marco Bellinelli is a guy who couldn't guard a crosswalk. He's got him defending people. I mean, he's got to defend him Dwayne Wade. Nazi Muhammad's a backup big helping him out. Nazi Muhammad's another guy. No one wanted him. Thibodeau creates these guys, makes them into players. It's amazing what he's done. And yeah, they may be out of gas at one point or another, but he's getting them to dig deep. The effort to me is going to be there. It's not going to be easy for Miami. The angriest guy in the country when Brooklyn pulled a no-show in game seven of that first round series was LeBron James, because this is not going to be easy for the Heat from here on out. Yeah, and, and I've, I've said this before a lot about Co uh, Coach Thibodeau is that uh, what I'm most impressed, and he might not even be that impressed with what he has done because it's probably very simple to him how he breaks it down and teaches it, and they can they just simply do the very fundamental defensive things that he teaches, but the, the idea that he can get all five guys at, at all times to buy into it is, is the, what's most impressive. It's probably more the mental thing than it is the X's and O's for him 
Uh, the Bulls do this. They got hammered by Denver, and they'll, they'll get blown out from time to time because almost for the reason that it works is because they stick so steadfastly to their game plan, knowing that in the long run it will give them the best chance to win. And that's what's most impressive to me as well is that when you can get those – players to believe it and really believe it that even though they got blown out in one game they know that they stick to it in the long run it'll give them the best chance to win they have a chance and that's what's going to happen I think in uh, in game three tonight uh, they're, they're certainly going to have a chance to win and I think you make a great point about discipline because discipline is a big theme in this playoffs we just talked about Miami being disciplined enough to run all the time because that's going to be their source of easy baskets against the Bulls when we get into the Knicks you You'll hear me talk a lot about the discipline that they need to show on their offense. Discipline's a big theme. Tom Thibodeau preaches more discipline than any other coach in the league, but for one reason or another, he's able to get it out of his guys. He does a fantastic job in, as you said, getting them to buy in, playing the system, having that one foot almost attached to the paint. So you're, you're, sque you're squeezing an offense to, to, the, to the outside, to the perimeter. It's, he does a fantastic job philosophically with what he does, but he also gets the most out of guys. You know, yeah. Nate Robinson, Bill Simmons calls him the irrational confidence guy. Thibodeau's got this whole irrational confidence thing completely harnessed, where it's actually become somewhat rational confidence, where, you know, he doesn't have a guy that can take a big shot at the end of the game. He's made Nate Robinson that guy. And Nate Robinson's hitting big shots at the end of playoff games when everybody in the court knows he's taking them. That, to me, is an amazing accomplishment for a head coach. I used to call Nate Robinson sideshow Nate. I thought he was a clown. He's not a clown. He could be a, a, an excellent bench scorer for a championship team, and that's an amazing thing. Tom Thibodeau gets credited with, with a lot of that. Not only, not only Tom, but Nate obviously also, but Thibodeau gets a lot of credit for developing him that way. And look at the shots he's taking now. I, I agreed. I never thought he would be anything more than a crazy chucker in the in the mold of uh, Marbury and those kind of guys. But he's coming off screen and rolls off of a jump stop, nice and smooth, uh, under control, hitting jump shots. He recognized Ray Allen was on him at the end of game one and isolated and went right by him for a nice, easy layup attempt. So those are the shots that he didn't use to take. So that's what's most impressive. Yeah, he's become – a viable point guard in the NBA, and it's a, it's just a, it kind of been a pleasure and a revelation because I, I don't think anybody would have given him this kind of credit, uh, you know, two years ago playing for the Celtics. I'm glad you brought up the Ray Allen play because the Ray Allen play epitomizes so much as what, of what's gotten good about Nate Robinson. Number one, the recognition that he had Allen alone and knew he could beat him, so he waved off the screen. Didn't need to pick, waved it off. The second thing, and I know you, out of anybody, love this the most, how about the lefty layup? How about taking him on the left side? And a guy who's, I mean, they call him 5'9", he's probably more like 5'6". Okay, but using that small body of his to shield off a defender who's much longer than him and use his left hand to lay it in, it's fundamental, pretty basketball. It's not something I'm sure Nate executes all that well, you know, with whatever destinations he was at last year where I don't think Nate was under coach. I just think something's happened with a player maturing and the right coach putting him in a system, and it's all worked very, very nicely for Nate Robinson and the Bulls. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think Nate in the past would have double pumped, jumped into the guy, hoping for a call, you know, faded away. He probably would have done a lot of very unconventional, non, you know, fundamental things, and would have probably missed more of those shots. So that's the difference. And I, I would suspect, and this is what I usually do with my players, I'll just show them those plays. Look Look how you're shooting these things. You are taking, you know, 15 percentage points off of your shooting percentage when you shoot the, those kind of shots. And so I think a lot of times when you show it in, in HD, it really makes a, a, a difference. And there's no doubt that that's a big change in his game. So I think the issue the Bulls have is they're missing two starters and then Derrick Rose is not going to come back, doesn't sound like now. And so uh, it's not going to – it's just a recipe for disaster for them ultimately. Uh, I would like to think they're going to get one more game, but that's about it. I totally agree with you. I think they probably can get one more game. I will say this, Nick. I, I will be out, somewhat outraged if they try to bring Lil Dang back here after what he just went through medically. You know, it's very interesting. You've, I've seen some interesting stories here. Tom Zilla wrote something the other day about the Bulls medical staff and the volume of misses that they've had on some of their players and how bad it's been and how, you know, they played Omar Ashik with a broken leg. Dang has played with some serious injuries here. At one point or another, you talk about something about a spinal tap going bad and a guy needing a blood patch. You know, at certain times, basketball has to take a back seat. He went out to try to shoot the other day. It was far too weak. You have enough respect for the man and who he is and what he's given you over the years to not put any pressure on him and allow him to recover at his own pace. So I, I, that's just an aside I want 
wanted to throw in there about the Bulls here, it, that it really is something that it would bother the heck out of me if they pushed Dang back onto the court here. Yeah, well, we'll have to see. I mean, and then Kirk Heinrich is not getting any better with the MRI. Didn't reveal any improvement. So, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing, though, is if those two had come back or do come back in their full strength, you, you, you got to kind of start to put it in your head that the Bulls could have beaten the Heat. They could have. They could have. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think they will. But I will say this to you. Next year is going to be very interesting. You got Dang in the last year of a contract. There's a significant chance they can amnesty Boozer to create some cap space here. Rose is an attractive guy to play with. You look at what they've developed this year, and Noah's made an enormous improvement in his game. He's become an elite player in the league. And you look at what Jimmy Butler's become, who's a, one of my favorites, man, and a fun guy to watch. Did a fantastic job on LeBron in game one. Terrific defensive player, developing his offense. This is a team that when they get Rose back, playing like Rose and 100% healthy, very, very scary next year for Miami. Miami ought to win it this year because I'm not sure next year they're going to be able to get out of the East past the Bulls. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, if they, they add Misty Boozer, they can figure something out. The guy who's available is probably Pau Gasol. He would, might be the guy that would, would really fit in there and give him a championship. That's a great point. And I think Pau Gasol, if they could figure out a way to bring him in on a one-year deal, it just might be attractive. Um, they'd have to – they. They have this. They'll probably have a slot for him with Boozer. It's it's a close to a, a fit, and you could tweak a couple of smaller contracts to make something like that work. Gasol would be a perfect player for them because he'd be a guy that you would actually. It's funny. I, I watched. I had a couple months ago. I watched the 2010 Game Seven of the NBA Finals, where with Kobe Bryant, Garnett. Paul Pierce and Rondo on the court. Pat Gasol was the best player on the court. And not just offensively. He was hedging in the pick and roll like a madman. That Pat was in there somewhere. I would bet money, Nick, okay, that Tom Thibodeau could find that Pat if they brought Pat in for next right. year. Yeah, I, I hate Pau Gasol's defense. I think it's terrible, but I do agree that in the right circumstance, he, he did play better defense with Phil Jackson. There's no question with, with uh, Thibodeau that they could get him to get to be – listen, they're playing with Boozer right now. It couldn't be any worse, and they're competing with the Heat. So there's no question that Pau would be better. Uh, I, it might have to be a trade because I feel like you can't – I don't know, they wouldn't have enough contracts to, to max. I don't know. I'll get Larry Kuhn on here, and he'll tell us how that works. But – um, at any rate, it'd be, it's a, it, this will be an interesting offseason for the Bulls. Let's move on to the um, the next, uh, this is probably near and dear to your heart, uh, which is the Knicks versus Pacers. I just did a breakdown of the, of the uh, Pacers and Knicks, that huge run, the 36-4 run, and I went through every possession that the Knicks uh, had during that run. I don't know if you saw it or not, but... All the Knicks fans came at me, kind of like that lady in Miami with the finger in Noah's face. I mean, that's how I felt. And... Um, you know, what are your, what's your take so far in the series and what's going to happen? Well, I was I discussed discipline before. Discipline is probably more important for the Knicks offensively than it is for any other team in any other unit here in the playoffs because the Knicks are dynamic offensively when the ball's in Felton's hands. They're running the high screen and roll. You know, Tyson Chandler, to me, Knicks, one of the best screeners in the NBA. And that's maybe, the you know, I, as much as Anthony's this wonderful shooter and this wonderful scorer, Tyson Chandler's screening may be the best offensive asset the Knicks have as a team. So when you can use Chandler, whether it's pin downs, cross screens, whether it's at, in a high screen and roll, a side pick and roll, but, you know, do a staggered screen and roll, but stuff where you have Chandler screening, the ball in Felton's hands, and the ability to find shooters, that's where the Knicks offense is at their best. If they ask Carmelo Anthony to do a little less, he will do a lot more. But laziness sets in. We like Melo's matchup. We're going to feed him the ball. It's Melo time. That's garbage. It's got to be a diversified offense. You saw what happened at the end of the Boston series where they fell in love with the ISOs. They became easy to defend. And these are not – it's not a bad defensive team they're playing. Nick. This is a very good defensive team. If you make it easy for them and just hand the ball to one guy and stand around, they're going to shut you down. They're going to stop you because that one guy – and listen, I, I'm, I'm never in the camp, especially after the season, that Anthony is a selfish player. I think he's an assassin of a scorer who looks to be – aggressive and I do think he finds shooters when he has to so with that said he's still an easy guy to force into taking bad shots so I think if the Knicks have some discipline offensively I think you, you will see them perform much better in the series I just have I picked Indiana at six to beginning I'm sticking with that because I do love Indiana defensively and I don't trust the Knicks to be as disciplined as they need to be Right. Uh, I, I think 
in a um, in a seven game series, it's going to be a problem for them as far as uh, with the shot selection. The only thing that the Pacers have as a problem is their um, inability to score. And I don't think it has anything to do as much with the Knicks. And what I showed in the breakdown was that they were just they turned the ball over a couple of times on dropped passes. Uh, there were a couple of fouls in there that that were really dicey that I don't think would get called um, in Indiana. And so um, it's a real interesting thing where you know I, I just see I feel like the, the discipline on defense is not there by the Knicks, and I don't think they're going to win the series. I want to share with you some stats I, I'm, I've been amassing here with um, with the. Um, the, the five-man lineup. So I went and looked through the Knicks-Indiana, the best and the worst five-man lineups. And I don't think it votes well for the Knicks because um, I wish I had more of a screenshot to show you, but I'll just tell you. The top five, the top five-man uh, lineup for the Knicks, uh, for the, the Pacers, is their, are their starters. And the net rating, when you compare the offensive and the defensive rating, is plus 12.5 for 52 minutes over two games. So their starters are getting the job done, and that's the most common lineup he's playing. He's playing a lot of minutes there. And so when you look at the, the, the Knicks starters, that actually is not the worst five-man, but the second worst five-man lineup they have at negative 5.1 in the net rating. And so when you're talking about starters and you max them up, and then, you know, it would it, it, be concerning. Now, the other thing that's concerning is that um, Woodson has only played the starters 22 minutes in two games. And so what that tells me is that he's rotating lineups and shuffling in and out all over the place. There isn't a lot of stability with who's playing with whom. No, listen, there, there certainly is. First of all, back to Indiana for a minute. Yes, there, he hammers his starting lineup tons of minutes, which is one of the reasons that after that big run with about six minutes, that's left in the game, Vogel pulled the Greg Popovich and called the dogs off. You know what, let my guys rest, live to fight another day here, as opposed to have them play in a feudal game at this point. Um, the turnovers for them are huge in this series. Because it, if they turn the ball over to the Knicks, they give the Knicks a source of easy baskets that the Knicks normally struggle for. So they have to be very careful there. And it's funny because earlier in the season, Frank Vogel prohibited Paul George from splitting any double teams because it was a recipe for a turnover. If you look in that run, Nick, he got back to trying to split double teams. That's a bad thing for Paul George to do. So you'll, I think you'll see that stop. And, again, their two, the primary ball handlers, Hill, their secondary ball handlers, George, 11 turnovers between the two of them in that game. That absolutely has to stop. When you look at the Knicks lineups, Woodson's in a tough spot, okay, because he can turn around and go big and play, whether it's a Kenyon Martin or now Amari Stoudemire is coming back at big forward and swing Anthony to small forward. The problem with that is that's not really how they've had success all year. That changes the, the totally changes the dynamic of their offense and takes a shooter off the floor. It's a big problem for them. So now what you're doing is you're essentially consenting to ugly ball. We're going to play Indiana head-to-head -head ugly ball. Indiana is maybe the best ugly team in the league, including Chicago. They play real good ugly. So if you're the Knicks and you do that, that becomes a very tough spot for Woodson. I think you make a very good point in the respect that he has to stay, maybe not necessarily with his starters, but he's got to be faithful to the small lineup and live with the mismatches. It may mean that David West destroys him, and that certainly it happened in game one. It can happen here going forward. But for the Knicks to win this series, you know, you said it before, their defense isn't good enough to shut down Indiana completely, even though they did in that run. But offensively, they're going to have to find ways to get baskets. Playing big is not going to do that for them. So I do think Woodson's got to be faithful and, in, for lack of a better term, dance with the one that brought him. Absolutely. Now let's look at the worst five lineup, uh, first worst five man lineup for the Pacers, uh, which is DJ Augustine, Paul George, Tyler Hansborough, uh, Roy Hibbert, and um, and Sam Young. <laughs> and I think that just kind of tells you when you have Augustine and Young in the same lineup, you're going to have a real problem. Uh, their net rating is negative 84.6. In, in a small sample, I think it's only about eight minutes for the two games. Uh, but, but remember, uh, a lot of times after the first uh, uh, lineup that plays, you know, 18 or 20 minutes, the other ones only play about four minutes at a time. So it's not that small. But uh, they, they can't score, and they are giving up a lot of points. So I would look for Sam Young to not get hardly any time. He looked awful out there. And, uh, and it's, that's the real key here. I'm sure that Vogel is looking at this, too. On the flip side, um, the, the best, I don't know why I said the best uh, lineup for the Knicks, 
is when you flip Shumpert and J.R. Smith in the starting lineup, their offensive rating is off the charts, 167.8. And, uh, and their defensive rating is 50. So they have a net rating of 117.8. Very small sample size, again, six minutes. But uh, Woodson shuffled his lineup so much that a six minutes over two games is actually one of his more played lineups. And so you should look for more of this uh, with Prigioni, J.R. Smith, Jason Kidd, uh, Tyson Chandler, and Carmelo Anthony, actually. So I, 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 didn't, I missed one other uh, thing there with Jason Kidd. So with Kidd, Prigioni, and J.R. Smith in there, um, I have to imagine it's Kidd and Prigioni giving him stability out there, making good decisions. Well, Prigioni's been outstanding in the playoffs. He's been he's played terrific. He played a big role in that run. Felton got banged up. Prigioni came in and did his thing. He's another guy you talk about a high screen and roll for the Knicks and getting somebody in the paint. Prigioni does that very well, also. You know, Jr. is the big conundrum here. Because Shumpert's been terrific in these playoffs. So when you look at, at good lineups, and, and I don't think it's any coincidence, Nick, that that best lineup for the Knicks is a small lineup with Anthony at the four. Okay? That is that is going to be what they have to stick with here. It's going to be a, not a good thing for them to spend too much time going big. Um, but, you know, so from that standpoint, you got to get your shooters on the floor. I, I will tell you, Jason Kidd, who – provides a ton of stability for them, still plays very good defense, and is always the smartest player on the basketball court. He had scored a point in four games. So at one point or another, and I know Woody's going to stick with him, and he's going to and he's gonna, you know, let him keep shooting. At one point or another, a couple of these shots are going to have to fall. The other problem for Knicks is J.R. Smith. And, and I think J.R. Smith the, in last year averaged 1.6 free throws a game. This year he averaged 3.9 free throws a game. Okay, JR, in this bad stretch he's run, Nick, he's gotten away from putting it on the floor and taking it to the basket. That's that JR Smith has to emerge here. It can't be he will if he's only shooting from the outside, he's gonna take more bad shots than good ones. You get him to put it on the floor and take it to the basket. Best way for him to break a slump, and the Knicks do not win this series unless they get more out of JR Smith. Right, absolutely. I mean, he's gonna be the key because he's such a high usage player when he's in there that if he's not not functioning at a high level. And he also, Carmelo is shooting very poorly for the playoffs. Uh, it's a really bad recipe when you play against the good defensive teams. And, you know, that's why I don't think they're going to make it out of, this, out of the second round, honestly. I feel like it might be seven games, but I still feel like the Pacers have enough to make them so inefficient they're not going to be able to, to, to win, you know, four games. I totally agree with you. I picked Indiana at the beginning of the series. It, despite that big 30-2 to two run, I've seen nothing out of Indiana that makes me think they're not going to win the series. Here's the thing about the Pacers. got to understand, Nick. Okay, No one causes droughts as good as the Pacers does, but very few do droughts as good as the Pacers do. And you saw them in one of their bad droughts where they just struggled to score. But again, Vogel's a very good coach. It's interesting because they're one of the slowest tempos team in the league. You talk to Frank Vogel, and he's going to tell you that he wants them to play with the pace. He wants them to play with tempo and get out and get some easy baskets. They're another team who's easy basket challenge. So I, I think you'll see some of that out of them. I don't think you'll – I don't – again, we talk about outliers. That 30-2 to two run in that game was an outlier. The Knicks were due to heat up a little bit, and the Pacers kind of ran out of steam, and Vogel pretty much determined on the surface – we leave at 1-1. We're pretty happy to walk out of this series. I walk out of Madison Square Garden going back home at 1-1 and pretty confident we can take care of business in our own building. Well, we shall see. It'll be interesting. And let's talk about the last series we haven't mentioned yet, which is uh, the Thunder versus Grizzlies. Now, this is a really interesting thing because both games have been pretty close. But in my mind, Memphis has almost dominated the series. And I have some lineup issues uh, that I can share with you here, which is fascinating. The, um, let's see here, OKC's uh, starters, which has gotten by far the most minutes, is their worst five-man lineup. And their net rating is negative 26.8 in 28 minutes over two games. Their offensive rating is 64.7. Okay. Now, that is mostly because you have Perkins out there, which is four on five. And when you, when you go, and remember, this is the best defense in the league. That is not only not only the best defense because they are over the 82 games, but now they have prepared for OKC for several days ahead of time, and so they are just shutting them down. And when, when you have Reggie Jackson also running the point, he's doing okay. He's not trying to force anything, and this is obviously where Russell Westbrook is really hurting them by not playing now. The best lineup for Memphis is are the starters in 33 minutes. They're a plus 15.2. So you're talking about the most played lineups for both teams, and it's a blowout by far. 
So I don't see any hope for OKC getting out of this out of this um, this round. I totally agree with you, Nick. I, I think, and I, I think your net rating stuff is very interesting in that respect because I don't. I think Brooks has got to get a lot more creative. We need to see more Collison. Collison does a decent job on. He's probably he is. I would not probably he is OKC's best Zach Randolph defender. I know why he's riding Perkins because he can bother Marcus Saul the most. I think in the end he may have to live with a Baca doing that because Perkins, as you you said very eloquently, it's four on five and that's an absolute the mess on the offensive end against one of the best defensive teams in the league. But here's, you know, we can almost crystallize it to be a little bit simpler. Um, you know, OKC, beyond Durant and Westbrook, has struggled to score this year, believe it or not. Okay, and their, their big source of getting other guys' points is getting out in transition and running. Westbrook is the engine that does that. He drives that transition game. Without Westbrook, that transition game's gone. Now you're counting on Kevin Martin to be your second score. So if you're Memphis and you think, wait, wait a second, Durant, Durant can't win this alone. And Kevin Durant has played tremendous, Nick. He's been terrific here, but he can't do it alone. So if you're relying on Kevin Martin to be your second score and you're Memphis with your perimeter defenders being Tony Allen and Tayshaun Prince and Pondexter and guys that guard well, and you're telling me, well, if we shut down Kevin Martin, we can pretty much win. That's not really a hard thing for Memphis to do. So I think that's where they stand right now is, is it's a pretty simple thing. Even Fisher went nuts and had 19 points in game two. Didn't matter. If Martin's going to go 2 of 11, we can start shoveling dirt on OKC right now. That That's and, and that's the bottom line here for OKC. they got to find ways to get more points out of guys. Now, you mentioned Jackson. I feel like they're asking Durant to do far too much. I don't care how good a player is. LeBron James, Kevin Durant, you can't ask a guy to be your primary ball handler, okay, and get your team in the offense and be your primary scorer and be highly efficient highly effective at both roles. You just can't. Okay, so you've got to find somebody else to do one of those. You're not going to find another guy to be your primary scorer. So I think you have to literally use Reggie Jackson exactly how you use Westbrook. Give him the same amount of rope, the same this, – just let him do – let him try to be Westbrook. He's not going to be Westbrook, but he may surprise you a little bit and certainly have some effectiveness, and you need to give Memphis somebody else that they legitimately need to worry about because they have nobody need to worry about. And look up and down that OKC roster, you've got nobody else. Now, getting back to your lineup stuff, I think that's going to revolve around playing small, more perimeter guys on the court. Let me see Jackson, Sevalosha, Martin. Durant and one of your bigs and you know what you'll struggle a little defensively but offensively you may give them a little bit of a run and have a chance to get some transition baskets absolutely and the Collison thing has been uh, uh, the biggest conundrum and it's been this way for two playoffs now where he doesn't play enough and they let Perkins play too much the best five-man lineup OKC has is KD, Derek Fisher, Serge Ibaka, Kevin Martin and Perkins and in only eight minutes, they're a plus 27.8. I guarantee you, if you take Perkins out and put Collison in there, that number goes up even farther. And that's what we haven't seen enough of. And again, I don't know what it is about Collison and why they don't play him more, but the guy has uh, such a huge upside offensively compared to Perkins. And I think does almost the same thing, if not more, defensively. And when you're talking about Perkins, if the only thing you can say is that he sets really good screens, then I don't think that's worth enough to keep him in the lineup as much as they have. I agree with you. And, I'm gonna, and I'll give you Scott Brooks' logic on playing and how much he has. Perkins is one huge strength on a basketball court is as a post defender. He's a big, physical, tough, low post defender. Bodies guys off the blocks, distracts them. So you say, okay, we're going to put him on Marcus Saul, their seven-footer. Well, that's fine. But Marcus Saul, who does spend some time on the low post, spends a lot more time on the high post. And Randolph is their big low post guy. So he's pulling Perkins away from the basket, which is almost, almost damaging. To me, I'd rather say, you know what, even if you're going to go too big, which I wouldn't do, but I would live, if, if you're going to go the two bigs, live with Ibaka on him. See what Ibaka can do. Maybe the shot blocking distracts him a little bit. Ibaka can move a little bit better on the perimeter. Perkins has got to play a little less here. And if they're going to play some small ball and you got to live with Durant having to guard a Randolph or a Gasol, put him on Gasol. Let him distract him on the perimeter a little bit. I think it will it work. It probably won't work. But here's my point. You're not going to beat Marc Gasol with girth when he steps out to the high point. High, high post. So if you can beat him with some length, or at least try to distract him with some length, and understand it's a matchup you're going to lose, but the match on the other end is going to be difficult, because what are they going to do when Durant's a big forward, and they got to figure out places to put both Gasol and Randolph. So I think playing small is Brooks' best thing here. I would really like to see him go big minutes with a small lineup. i got a feeling he's not going to. He's going to try to do this round peg square hole thing, Nick. 
Yeah, and I, I the, the Durant thing, even on Gasol, is kind of crazy, but if you have him front, he's much quicker than Gasol. Uh, if they try and go down low every time, which they will, uh, if he fronted him, I think that would actually do a, go a long way to thwarting that uh, advantage that Memphis has. The problem with that is, is that it's very tiring to do that, and you have to bang and, and move and really play hard, and then going back on offense and have to be the primary scorer would, might wear him out. But you are right. The, the present way they're playing now is a six-game loss for them at best, and so they need to do something different than what they're doing. And uh, again, Scott Brooks's biggest weakness, I think, is, is adjustment. Well, I think he's got a few, but adjusting in mid-game and from game to game is something that he doesn't seem to do very well. Uh, the, the last thing I remember he did well actually was putting Cephalosha on Tony Parker last year, and um, I'm still amazed even today that Pop couldn't come back with any counter for that, and they ended up losing four in a row. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I happen to agree with you. I, I was surprised that Pop couldn't do anything there, but, you know, the problem the Spurs had last year in that series wouldn't be a problem they'd have this year which is tempo, and and they, you know, OKC last year with Durant, Westbrook, and Harden was as good a running team as you'll ever see, and San Antonio liked to play fast tempo last year also. The advent of Splitter to being a major player for them has allowed them to be a much more effective, slower team, so that to me is where Pop kind of had some issues last year. I would have, even though they played fast, I would have tried to slow them down. I think this year, if the two teams end up against each other, which I don't think they're going to, very frankly, we could end up seeing Memphis and Golden State in the West Fine. But I would think that you have to do some tempo control there. Now, OKC right now, they're not as hard to tempo control without Westbrook. They're easy. So you can actually run them now because they're, from an athletic standpoint, they're somewhat compromised without their great athlete. We are getting a little bit of a vision into how meaningful Russell Westbrook is, not only to OKC's success, but to their style of play. They can't be true to their style of play without having Westbrook on the floor. Absolutely. So I think let's let's review all the, um, the our predictions so far. I believe we are both in agreement that Memphis wins this in in, in six or seven, right? Six. I probably. agree. I think it's. I think I will take it. I think it could be five or six. I think Memphis could run the table here in the next three. Okay, Miami and Chicago. I, if it got to Game Six, I, I would be happy for the Bulls. I'm not even sure it's going to get that far. I would agree with you. I think it probably could go five. Most likely, I think the Bulls will get one more. It'll be in six. Okay, so then we go uh, Knicks Pacers. I'm willing to think it goes seven games, but I still think the Pacers pull it out. I think the Pacers are going to win the series in six. I think the Pacers are going to come and hold serve at home, go 3-1, get beat back in New York, and come home for a game six and finish business. Okay, sounds good to me. And our last one is uh, the Warriors versus the uh, Spurs. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to say the Warriors really have a shot, even though they've, they've dominated so far. What's your take on that? This is a tough one. I picked the Spurs in seven at the beginning of the series. And, Nick, I'm stubborn. I don't jump off predictions so quickly. This one has got me in a little bit of a conundrum. It's almost a coin flip here, just because Golden State's so good at home. And, and with what I've seen in these first two games about some issues that the Spurs are having defensively that I'm not sure how easily solvable they are, Okay, it's tough for me to envision the Warriors playing as well as they are with losing one of these games at home. And if the Spurs fall down 3-1 in the series, they're in a whole lot of trouble. With that said, I'm going to have faith in Greg Popovich, figure he may make an adjustment or two here to make life a little more difficult for Curry and Thompson. I'll stick with the Spurs in seven, but I'm, I'm looking at this one as more of a coin flip, Nick. Yeah, I, I will say this. If the Spurs do not win tonight, it's over. If they can't get the game three in Oracle, it's over. So uh, that's my prediction there. I, I kind of want to lean to the Warriors right now because I'm excited about them and they're young and it's fun. Uh, you, For everything you said is right, but I got to tell you right now, it was, if they win game three, the Warriors win game three, then I will have no problem saying it's over. The Warriors, Warriors will win the series. Let me Let's ask you this. Talk. Yes. Let me ask you this. If they, get, if they get three but the Spurs get four and we go back to San Antonio 2-2, two, two, do you feel differently? No, I'm going to stick with my game. The game three is my is my turn right now. I mean, I know okay. game five is usually the big one, but I'm going to say game three at home, give them a two one lead. I think that's going to be what they need. So that's going to be exciting tonight. Then you have that as a must win for for the Spurs and Oracle tonight. Very interesting. I do, I do. So let's turn to some questions we have on Twitter from the uh, the Twitter folks and see what we have here. Um, let's uh, press this button. Now I got to scroll down because Twitter stinks. Oh, there we. Go. Now for one second, let me make this. All right, so let's see if we can find um, a good question here. Uh, what 
kind of adjustments can the Spurs do to contain Curry when he gets into big head mode? You want to take this one? I could take that one. What they need, and this is a crazy thing, they need to double him with some size out beyond the three-point arc and get that ball out of his hands. They double him with a little guy, and he has a field of vision. He'll kill you with passes. But you want to funnel Curry into – two-point range of the basketball court. If Curry's going to beat you with long twos, you tip your hat to him. But you have to absolutely blitz him beyond the three-point line, get that ball out of his hands, live with the results, and God, don't double off Thompson. It's a very hard recipe to, to deal with because of the presence of Thompson as well. Nonetheless, it's probably the only thing the Spurs can do to see if they can keep Curry from, from getting that heat check and going crazy. Well, the problem is what they were killing them with is um, is uh, when they when they scream with Duncan's man. Duncan is not going to blitz the ball handler. He can't. So if they do that and they screen uh, Curry with Duncan's man, I think they have to devise a defense, which I'm not sure it's possible this late in the season, where somebody else switches with him as the screener is coming out who is quicker and more mobile. I think it's doable, but I've rarely seen it work. And, um, and if you can do that, that's your only hope so that Duncan can kind of always play playing a bit of a zone in that lane. So that's a tough one for them. That's a great question. Um, let's one of the things I think, Nick, one of the things I do think is that if you can put Duncan, whether it's on green, whether it's on a zelly, where if you can get Duncan in one of the off matchups to invite them to scream with one of their lesser offensive guys and keep Splitter on Bogut, who's their favorable screener in that spot, you bring your best pick and roll defender to the ball. Yeah, okay, that works for me. Well, let's look here. Joe Garcia retweeted. Thank you. Uh, and remember, if you if you retweet, we'll give you a quick shout. Thank you, uh, Six Jeremiah. Jim says, not really a prediction as much as what people may th – uh, let's see. That's not a question. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, who else is – okay, thank you, Gage, for uh, retweeting. If Taj can get fined for verbal abuse, shouldn't officials be subject to the fines for blatant rule book abuse? I guess. Uh, I think, you know, listen. And I think that uh, David Stern in the NBA goes to very, very big lengths to protect these officials. Too much almost at times. So I, I think you see the officials really, and I don't think, I think the second round has been a much better officiated uh, group of games than the first round was. Nonetheless, I mean, even these flopping rules, which I know I'm in the minority here, I found them to be absurd um, because I just think you have to ask the officials to do their jobs better. Stern doesn't want to do that. He protects the officials with everything they have, even if they don't do a wonderful job. Um, not much to say about that. It is what it is. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next question. So we have a retweet from Tammy Tremaine, Mrs. NBA. Oh, always great insight from her. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> All right, more more hate from the Knicks fans. Uh, Jay, thank you for the retweet. Um, and Tammy and Wagner for the retweet, thank you. Is Phil Jackson a possibility for OKC? I don't think so. I think that, you know, uh, I think they're going to chalk it up to Russell Westbrook being injured uh, and give Scott Brooks at least another year. What do you think? Uh, I, well, Scott Brooks, you know, keep in mind, Nick, he signed a four-year deal before this season, at the end of last season. Um, I would not – Clay Bennett doesn't strike me as the type of owner that's eaten three years of that kind of money. So I think Brooks probably gets two more years. Phil Jackson's not a possibility for OKC. To me, as a coach, Phil Jackson's a possibility for one team and one team only, and it's the Lakers. Otherwise, I don't see Phil Jackson getting back on the sidelines with any team that's not the Lakers. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's do my Ryan, thanks for the retweets. And Miramar Sports uh, uh, retweeted me, but not from this, not from our conversation. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Zelko, thank you for the retweet. Let's see here. Uh, and San Antonio Holmes, awesome. Um, how should the Pacers contain the three-point threat the Knicks have? Interesting. You know, I, I think that for the Pacers, ultimately staying at home on Anthony and Smith is going to be the best way to go. Charles Barkley has a theory about defending the Knicks, and it sounds overly simplistic, but I think it's smart. I think teams get away from it too much. I think ultimately Anthony will not beat you alone. So if you single cover Anthony and make sure that you stay out on the shooters and don't let Smith get open threes and Novak if he's in the game and, and Kidd and Prigioni and Shumper, you stay on those other shooters on the perimeter and let Anthony beat you, I think you can beat the Knicks. But it's that doubling of Anthony. It's that temptation to want to throw to run to 
guys at him when he gets hot. That is what really opens things up for the Knicks because Anthony, when he gets hot, he's not shy about finding shooters when they're open. He certainly will do that. So staying at home and single cover covering Anthony, to me, is how you keep the Knicks from really killing you because the Knicks don't kill you till all those other guys start knocking in three-point shots. Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, you know, letting letting Melo hurt the Knicks himself will do it. High volume shots when he thinks he's got one on one advantages, where he ends up shooting, you know, in the 40% range, will ultimately hurt the Knicks. So I agree. I think when you force it out of his hands is when you get into trouble. Um, let's see here. Doug and Sir Pedro, thanks for the retweet. Awesome. Uh, and we want Phil. Uh, there's the answer to your Phil Jackson question. Um, Jay, thanks for the retweet. And Mr. Roy, M. Royer. Um, Let's see here. Thank you, 360, Doc Strange. Uh, Coach Nick Van, number one. All right. Hey, I didn't know there was a Coach Nick Van, number one. Um, let's see here. How long do you think Curry and Thompson can keep up with this one uh, off one leg, 35-foot shooting? Did you see that three-pointer he hit, the Dirk leg, off of uh, the pick and roll at, on game two? I did. It was a fun shot. It was, it was a shot that, you know, frankly, Nick – Hey, are you there? I'm with you. We lost you. All right. Uh, am I still here? All right. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened, but I pressed a couple buttons. It looks like we're still live. So let's. Uh, I don't even know what you said. Did you see that 35 foot shot with off one leg? Oh, I certainly did. It was. Listen, it, what I said about it was that it's one of those shots that if any other guy takes in the league, you and I as old school guys fry him for awful shot selection and oh my God, what the heck is this guy thinking? For Steph Curry, it's a day's work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen, there's not many shots I would fault him for taking these days. He's so he's such he's so good. Uh, let's see, Jonathan and Coach Nick fan, thanks for the retweet. Um, are we? Uh, let's see here. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Gian, thanks for the retweet. Mr. C, thanks for the retweet, and uh, another retweet by Gian. Let's go back and let's get a couple more questions, then we'll finish this up. So, um, yeah, let's see here. Clay and Curry, the best shooting pair ever. What do you think, Brian? I'm not going there right now. I, I, I just I, I think they're too young. I, I, I think could they be at one point? Yes, but we got to see a heck of a lot more. They've had a terrific playoff here and they look great. But I am not in a hurry to take them and put them at historical in a historical perspective right now. I'm just not. I, I think if they could be the greatest shooting pair ever right now. I am so not willing to go there at this stage of the game. Fair enough. I don't know. I, I, I might agree with you on that one, too, although I don't think that anyone's better than Steph Curry. Uh, and I might even go all time. But you're right. He needs to do it a little bit longer. But as it is now, I've never seen anybody make, make other pros look as bad, as, as foolish as he does uh, with his shooting. What do you think about Mike uh, of uh, Woodson? It looks like I think he wants J.R. Minutes, uh, J.R. Smith's minutes reduced. What do you think about that? I, I don't. I think you got to go with the same rotations you've had in the, in the regular season. I don't think you should really massively adjust things and, and get everybody all crazy in their minds by less or more playing time. What do you think about that? I, here's what how I would approach that. I would plan to not reduce his minutes. Okay, I would plan not to. And, and then what I would turn around and do is if you get Cole JR again and Gunn and JR and a JR that's not putting the ball on the floor to try to go to the basket, then I would start to sit him a little bit. But I wouldn't go into a game consciously saying we're reducing JR's minutes. Each game I would start with the thought that JR is going to play the same role for us that he's played all year. But if he starts to hurt us a little bit here and that, that starts to come up and the, and the bad shots are starting to become prevalent, I wouldn't hesitate to sit him. I certainly would not. But I think you have to go in with the thought that this is going to be the game J.R. Smith turns it around because he's been that kind of player all season. And I think it gets a little short-sighted when you start to run away from a player like that who's been so important to, to the Knicks' success this year. I agree. I, I agree. I think. I mean, I think he he is what he is. They know what he is. That's what they do. He he should play his regular minutes and then and and hope for the best. 
ADE, thanks for the retweet. Coach Nick Fan, uh, 15 grand for a ball sack dance and 25 for FU at Mother Effort, and just 5,000 for a flop is justified. Uh, you know, what do you think? Do you think that they, there should have been some suspensions with the uh, Noah and Taj Gibson uh, flap on game two? No, I don't think anybody should have gotten suspended. I think the officials have to take control of the game a little sooner. Um, I think the league gets hung up. Should Bell and Ali have been suspended for that? No, we shouldn't have. Sam Castell's been doing it all those years. You want to warn him and tell him if he does it again, we're going to suspend you. We don't want it done, or we're going to fine you. You can do that, but this is the, the league gets hung up with such nonsense and, and, and things that they shouldn't get hung up on. So, yes, I mean, what happened with Gibson and Noah, listen, you hassled officials, you got fined, it's over, move on. You don't pull players out of games for that stuff. You know, it's the, the league gets a little holier than thou with some of this stuff, Nick, and kind of forgets that, you know, basketball is fun, and it's a lot of fun to watch guys have fun playing this game. Absolutely. Well, this was a lot of fun, too, talking to you about the NBA. Great stuff. I know we uh, had a ton of people in this chat, so thanks for all the great questions. And um, we'll do it again later on in the playoffs, I hope. Nick, I look forward to it. I had a blast today with you and your viewers. It was fantastic. We should do it again very soon, my man. Awesome. And don't forget to follow Brian at Hoops Critic, and uh, you get a lot of great insight, and you'll see some great conversations between me and him on Twitter and him and everybody else on Twitter. So follow him there. Follow us at B-Ball Source, and don't forget at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You in? Are you in, Brian? Nick, I, I am in, my man. <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon. You got it, Fenn. Take care.